find your Bibles in John 4, 23 and 24. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now this ain't in the Bible, but I'm gonna say it. Sometimes the truth hurts. It hurts. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Those that are worship in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You place your Bibles down. Why don't we lift up our hands and talk to that Lord right now. Jesus, impart unto us. Help me to be changed today, to be renewed today, to find myself worshiping you in spirit and in truth, Lord, to get unstuck from my old ways and be a new me today that I can be led of your spirit, God, and your truth every day. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. The Bible lets us know in Malachi that the Lord says, For I am the Lord, I change not. And what's beautiful about that is, in other words, God is still looking for worshipers that will worship him in spirit and truth. Now, I know most of us don't truly understand the depth of what all that entails because sometimes similarities can be confusing. I remember as a young boy, we went from America to England and I was thrust onto a rugby field. How many know how to play rugby? That's what I thought. I, did, I didn't either. But all of a sudden I'm standing there and what looked like a football to me was a rugby ball. But it landed in my hands, Carol. So I did the only thing I knew what to do with a football or a ball that looked like that. I tucked it and I ran. And I knocked people over and I ran. There was some bigger than me, so I just ran. But I found myself at the other end, and I don't even remember what they call a touchdown in rugby today. And I got there, slammed that ball down, turned on it, yeah. And everybody was just staring at me. <laughs> then the next thing I know, I was awakened from my stupor at a coach yelling at me. What are you doing? And back then, they didn't have all this uh, politically correct stuff. He sued me out and asked what I was doing. I answered, not really considering my accent at the time. Well, I don't know what you call it here, but I just go to touch that. And he looked at me in the British way of getting upset. Told me this is rugby and that's not how you play it. You got to pass the ball back. I said, well, in football, we passed it forward. So anyway, I didn't know how to play. Some things were similar, but it isn't played that way. Anyway, so living for God, we need to understand some things. What is praise? And what is worship? In living for God, we have to understand these things. You know, understand the difference between praise and worship will bring a new depth in the way you honor the Lord. Honoring the Lord is a scriptural concept. You say, well, this is really remedial, but let's stop and ask some of us who've been around a little while, when's the last time you actually considered your worship, your praise, and how you honor the Lord. We need both. They work together in our walk with God. Throughout the Bible, we are commanded to praise the Lord. Psalms 103 and 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments. Hearken unto the voice of the Lord. So the angels are commanded to praise. All the inhabitants of the earth are instructed to praise the Lord. In Psalms 115 verse 6, let everything that hath breath Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. So we can praise him with singing and with shouting and with the dance. Did you know that? 
and with musical instruments of all types. And I want to say this, okay? But those of you ladies and those men that move forward during a worship service, thank you. Thank you. I want you to feel the liberty to worship and pray and sit here. And I want to say to those of you, don't you ever feel that you got to get stagnant and you're more worried about your seat than your Savior. Romans 15, 11 uses a word I want to bring out. It says, and again, praise ye the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him. Laud's a different word. It's where we get the word applaud. All ye people. Hey, he's worthy. And now, for those of us that can't carry a tune in a bucket, we are told in Psalms 98 and 4, we are even instructed to make a joyful noise. Corey and I got that in space. We'll keep on doing it. It says, make a joyful noise. Now, I, I looked up the reference on that. It literally means to split the ears with sound. <laughs> Shout for an alarm or joy. Make a noise. Make a sound. It's a war cry, alarm of battle, a sound, a signal. It's a shout in triumph. It's a shout in applause. It's a, it's a shout. It's an acknowledgement. I'm going to worship and praise my king. Hallelujah. Get excited about that. But however, the Bible does seem to apply that sometimes singing just isn't enough. Sometimes shouting will not be adequate. Sometimes dancing is out of the question. Sometimes words fail. It's possible in these moments. Joyful noise fits. Rather than complaining. Rather than being negative. What did that little bunny rabbit's mama say? If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Words are powerful. Some of you are so negative and stuck because all you got is that junk going through your mind. So, yeah, man, we, we, we've had four presidents since the last time you prayed through your mind to say something good about the things of God. You are so lofty in yourself, you think you can now sit in judgment of God rather than in adoration. You need to hear what I'm saying. Your noise should just about dictate your outcome. It says in Acts 16, 25, and 26, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And this may not mean nothing to you until you find out how they got into prison. They were beat. They were thrashed. They were probably hungry. They were hurting. The Bible says at midnight, it's dark. They're alone. There's some prisoners they can probably hear rustling in the darkness. It wasn't like prison today where you get your three squares and the TV and the lights are on all the time. No, they're in a dungeon. And the Bible says, and they sang praises unto God. And I dare say, in our arrogant American overstuffed, overfed, overstimulated spirits, it's easy to find yourself in the present God sitting there going, do something that'll move me. When God's looking at you saying, I'll do something when you move. Because he can, in reference, look back at a couple of prisoners that are bleeding and not getting the medical attention that we would cry and scream for. They sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. People hear you. Your family, your friends, your colleagues, your co-workers. Hey, if you can't say anything at all, make a joyful noise. That's right. If you don't like nothing that's going on, make a joyful noise. Oh, hallelujah. 
The prisoners heard them, and it says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. You realize that freedom can come from the person that will make a joyful noise, no matter the situation. Yeah. Praise has its place. Let praise replace complaints and being negative. And if, if, if in some of you, that might just be what you need right there as a starting point. Challenge one another. Those of you that live in the same house, let's just see how long you can go without saying something negative about anything. Hello? Are you hearing me? Praise from the Hebrew is a verb that means halal. It, it's actually where we get the word hallelujah. It means to praise, celebrate, to glory, to sing or boast. Praising is in fact the joyful recounting of all that God has done for us. Uh, the wonderful thing about that is you can look back and go, Lord, if he hadn't been for God, I wouldn't be here now. In other words, you're without excuse. If you got here, he got you here. Thank him for that. It's intertwined with the holiday we just celebrated, Thanksgiving. As we offer back to God appreciation for his mighty works on our behalf. How, how many here knows that if God hadn't pulled some strings, you wouldn't be here? If God hadn't have pulled you out, you never would have made the money you made or had the family you had. And if God hadn't, you just know that uh, you, you, you want to humble yourself to sit back and go, no, I, I, I may have picked the rocks, but God led it to the giant's forehead. The giant that went down in my life was because of God. I want to thank God for all that he's done. Psalms 150 in one of the stands of praise him for his mighty acts and praise him according to his excellent greatness. Some of you forgotten about that? Those are the two verses. The other ones start going into uh, musical instruments and dance, but don't forget that thank him and praise him for his acts and for his greatness. Understand praise is universal. It can be applied to, this is important. Praise is universal. We put praise everywhere. The best car I ever owned. Mm -hmm. See, praise seeps into other relationships as well as, man, I'll tell you, my family's the best family. I got, man, that's my best friend in the whole world. That's a good friend to me. That boss right there, that boss, man, that's the best boss I ever had. That's the best truck I ever owned. Let me tell you something. You need to get this done. You need to go to that place. That's praise. That's praise. You're praising something. Man, baby, that was the best dinner. Man, baby, you did a great job on this. Shirt, thank you so much. Hey, honey, you did a good job taking out the trash. Yeah. I got to throw a bone to the fellas. <laughs> Get a little praise. Okay, I may make you some cupcakes tomorrow if you're a good boy. <laughs> and that's a low praise. Only high praise belongs to God. The Psalms 149 and 6 says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two edged sword in there. What's our sword? Spirit and truth is right there, tucked right there in the Psalms. But I want to get to worship because we know how to praise. Your kid comes home with a great report card. Man, you need to praise that. Are you hearing me? Man, that day comes when that boy's out of diapers. You're going to do a dance, a jig, a shout, and buy him some cotton candy. I don't know, but you'll be glad when he grows up past that diaper stage. And Sister Jessica said, amen, holding on to Nehemiah. <laughs> Worship, however, comes from a different place. It comes from within our spirit. It comes from within. Worship should be reserved for God alone. If you're going to come under the power of anything to control you, it needs to be the Lord. 
are you hearing what I'm saying? And then Luke 4 and 8, it's a, it's, a, it's a sudden verse that arrests us. It says, and Jesus answered and said unto him, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, truth, truth. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. We're, we're, we're quickly arrested and pulled up short. Wait a minute. It got real serious when it came to worship. God's serious about what you're going to worship, what you're going to give yourself to. I watched some of you get upset at a, a song that said, I give myself away because the, the connotation bothers you. I wish it bothered you as much as some of the stuff you gave yourself to. Get thee behind me, Satan, it says. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Listen, praise can be a part of worship, but worship goes far beyond praise. Praise, now listen to me, praise is easy. Worship is not. I... I I've never seen it more obvious than just simply watching people struggle to find it. Because worship gets to the heart of who you are. Luke 6 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure. Did you see that? Just because you treasure it, don't make it good. Of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. What you worship, what you praise, listen to yourself. Words with your actions declare it. Declare what you worship. First Chronicles 21 and 24, I'm going to go back and read some of these to you. And King David said to Orna, nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price. You don't get a deal in worship. You don't look for that. It's, it's inappropriate. It's like a thief getting something at a discount. Sometimes our proclivities seep into areas of our life that cause us to be at odds with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because we're trying to make a deal. And God, oh, there ain't no deal here. You hear what I'm saying? David is going, I will buy it for full price. There's something, David did a lot of wrong, but I tell you one thing, he wasn't going to give worship to anything but God. For I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. God watches where we place value. You ain't going to trick him. You ain't going to bait and switch God. He knows what you value. In fact, it, all, it's, it can almost be mechanical that you got to turn around and give the very thing that hurts the most without unction merely to get yourself right with God because you deep now know the full what you love and what you've given yourself to. And the only way to get around is God ain't got to move on you. God ain't got to talk to you. You got to be honest with where you placed your heart. Luke 21, verses 2 and through 4, it says, And he saw also a poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say to you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than... Look, we're in America. We think we're big shots. We, put a little, we get a little money. Our whole country's consumed with it. Don't you think you're immune? Or then, if you're immune, then the Bible's a lie. Says so the rich have to snare. You've been caught. He said, "Of a truth, I say to you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in under their offerings of God, but she of a penury hath cast in all her own. She she worshipped. They praised. She worshipped. They praised. See, some of you look. They ain't got nothing, but they gave it all. They worshiped. You're praising. But he's looking for worshipers. 
You know what's beautiful about that is I gave you a rich example and I gave you a poor example. It's all up to the individual. Be careful of your accounting. Be careful of your assumption of what you think people give and what they don't give. Let me tell you something. If you're even noticing somebody else, you've missed you. Let me get the magnifying glass on me and check me. Of, of my abundance, have I ever put myself in a fix for God? That goes against everything in our nature and teaching. That's why I have to say, I, 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 I mean, I get it. Let's be apostolic. Let's be Pentecostal. But not just in title or mouth, but our deeds. Some of you all in when it comes to the truth, but where's your spirit? Where's the spirit behind your giving, your sacrifice? Mm, mm, mm. Whether rich or poor, your worship will be revealed. God sees. He sees. Those of you, you know, you've got yourself to the brink with your time, effort, and resources here at the church. God sees that. He knows that, man, you're sitting at home eating beans and rice and peanut butter and jelly and watching folks around here eating high in the hog talking about praise and worship. And you know you're really worshiping because it took something to get here tonight. I mean, you sit there with everything met in your life and someone whose world's falling apart comes walking up, worship and praise and God's looking, oh, they're casting in way more. You know who upset Jesus the most? The religious. You have to understand something. I, I got, I, I, I'm not preaching to you. I, I read this Bible. I don't want that to be me. That's so easy to be me in America. I'm going to tell you something right here. I'm not preaching at anybody in here. I never wanted to, I want to tell you something, I want us to be saved. I want us to be real. I want us, some, you young people growing up, get yourself around someone that's a giver, not someone that just talks about it. Find someone that's here doing ridiculous stuff for God. Find someone that's not afraid when there's a need to put some money in, put some time in. Not someone that's in a hurry to be someplace else. Get you around someone that's really all in. I'm going to say something. I, I, I know this. I, I, it's pretty awesome. We got people worshiping praise. I thought it was going to be so quiet tonight because I'm dealing with our flesh. Man, I tell you, I've been around this thing a long time. I tell you, the worst thing to deal with people in the flesh. And, and the, the, the people and people have been around church a long time have learned how to be in the flesh and act like they're in the spirit. To truly worship God, you're going to have to let go of self-worship. Self-worship is in that thing that it's that idea of it's not that you think of yourself less, you just think about yourself less. I tell you, I like being around those people that are doing something for God, not telling me what they've already done. I done this, I done that. I said, I want to do this. I'll do it. Get it done. Go after it. You I know some of you go for it. Knock on that door. Teach that. By, you, ain't be, you ain't held up by me. See, something's happened. Some people sit around here. They think they got to come to them. They got some God kingship syndrome. When we're disciples and servants have been saved by grace, we're, those people are still going. They're still serving. They still understand. Uh, I didn't get here with, uh, without praise and worship. I, ah. Maybe, 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 that, maybe that's just a little too much. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? You can't keep a thankful person down and you can't keep an unthankful person. Some of you missed that, but that's okay. See me later. First Samuel 15, 17 says, and Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel and the Lord anointed the king over Israel? See, the problem is, is when you forget where you came from. You forget. 
You forget who, Matthew 18 is a beautiful chapter to go read this week. You start treating people different than what God treated. Oh, wait a minute. Hello? Oh, except for the grace of God, there go I. I never, I, I don't ever want to, oh God, help me. I never want to get to a place where I don't think I need to be a worshiper, a praiser, a sacrificer, or a giver. I never want to get to a place. The only time you ever look down on someone is if you're picking them up. You're helping them out. First Peter, he's, he's, he's some beautiful words here. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Now listen, an, an elder is someone who's living for God properly. It's not just someone that's older. All of you be subject one to another. There's a balance act here. And be clothed with humility. Find, find someone humble. Find someone that's, you know what, hey man, whatever it takes, let's get it done. I'll, I'll take out that trash. Amen. I'll, clean, I'll clean that coffee, that coffee man. I, I, man, that, what can I, those people that are looking to serve. Yes. Yes. Hear what I'm saying? Yes. And be clothed with humility for God resisteth the proud. See, see, pride's like bad breath. Everybody knows you got it, but you. That won't help either. Someone needs to tell you. And he giveth grace to the humble. Mm. Humble yourselves. What? What? Humble yourself. That's an act. That's I'm going to. That's like, I'm, I'm going to give what hurts because I know I'm selfish. I'm going to humble myself because I know I deal with pride. I'm going to make myself walk forward and sit in an altar because I know I want to resist that. You have to understand, him that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him and his sin and the wages of sin is in other words. If you know you're struggling, if you know you got that problem, you got to do the opposite. If you know you're not good at apologizing, you ain't got to wait to feel it. Apologize if you know you're wrong. Save your marriage. Save that relationship. Shut your mouth and apologize. Some people are going to die so wrong they don't realize all they had to do was say, I'm sorry. But they're too arrogant to do that. What an amazing opportunity we have with God. To worship and praise him. And that's not my will, but thy will be done. God, I, I, I don't, I'm not standing on my own feet. I'm standing on his. Humble your, yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. I want the hand of God. It comes by humility. He resists the proud. You didn't get stopped. God didn't stop you. You got you stuck yourself. That he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care. This is not out of order here. Casting all your care upon him for he cares. You know why you want to do it all your way? You don't believe God. You don't trust God. I'm not putting that in God's hands. I'm not going to put my life in God's hands. I'm not going to put my finance in God's hands. I'm not going to put my life. I'm not going to give myself to the kingdom of God. I know better for me than God does. That's, that, that line is not out of order there. It's the point. Some of us get stuck because something happens in our life. Man, I got things in my life. It don't make sense to me. It, to me, it violated scripture. But okay, here I am. God, I'm going to leave it in your hands and keep on going. I had someone the other day get really, really adamant about something, and I sat back and looked at him and listened to him get real adamant. I said, you better hold up, Bubba. This may be you by next week. You don't know what's going to happen. You're going to find out big difference. You better know what the Bible said. So what did God do in this situation? We get real arrogant about stuff. We think we know. Let me tell you something. I'd rather defer to God every time. That's not my way out. It's my way in. I want to submit myself. And I don't know. We got a thing up here that says silence your phones. It's not difficult, folks. I'm not picking on it. I don't know where it's coming from, but I hear it. Just be careful. 
You're no, don't no, you're good. It happens. It was mine last week. It was. That's why right, I needed to pray, but I said, no, I'm going to get this dumb. Sister Denise came away. I got to turn this dumb thing down. It went off last. I refuse to allow all these things to, this is intimate time. You know what this is? This is, it. You know, how many, if you haven't gone on a date with your wife, you need to get someone in the church to watch your kids. Go on a date. Look across that candlelit table, stare in each other's eyes and get intimate. I believe in that. But you, they they got they don't they they're good they got enough kids, <laughs> but when you walk, they fill up half the church. What you talking about, sis? Hold on, y'all embarrassing sister Shaka Powers to so just back down, calm down. But you have to understand, God wants that into intimacy. So at some point, you got to just quit walking in to check time and come in. I want, to get, I want to get closer to you, Jesus. If the Bible says, I'm way off my notes now, he's looking to and fro to find somebody. Why are you out of his will if he's looking for someone? I, I heard someone not too long ago say, man, I don't even know what the will of God is. I'm like, how can that be? He's looking for someone. I've been around people in church a long time. The problem is just they stop being humble. Can, can, I, can I just release you? You're not the end all. Jesus is. You're not the Savior. He is. Give him your worship. Give him your, get your wife and husband and father and dad off the hook. Let's all stand and worship God right now. He's worthy. He saved. He redeemed. Casting all your care because he cares. He's worthy. He's worthy. Worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I praise you. Don't that feel great? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're hurting in your body right now, love the Lord. Worship him. If you got a financial need that's burying you, worship him. Give him your care. Listen, 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 listen. You need to get this. I, you need to get this. I want you to leave this place tonight. And when, you hear me when I pray, to missal, pray that prayer dismissal, but not from his presence. Let me tell you something. He resists the proud. It's still, still, it's still his responsibility when you leave the road. Let me talk to you men. You can't out Jesus, Jesus. Stop it. Your inheritance ain't going to be better than his. Stop being ignorant. Stop being proud. You can't teach them something better than the word of God. Stop it. Get, just lay that down. Cast that care on him. You don't have to be a big shot. He's a big God. 
One of the greatest things you can actually do is take all the trappings and all the things that you've piled onto your life over all the years of your living and shove that all aside. Your your style and your subcultures and, and your everything that you think make you you and, and take that and shove it aside and lay bare before the Lord. Here I am, Lord. I worship you. I I praise you. Remove anything that hinders this relationship. I want to worship. Oh, some of you, I, when I said that, some of you, oh. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. one of our, can I tell you, the greatest hindrance to our worship of God is our self-worship. Hey, honey, hey, sweetheart, every wife in the house is just a man who needs a God. You be a prayer warrior for him. You be a Proverbs 31 for him. Be a joint effort and worshipers and pray. That's what he's looking. You imagine a household with two worshipers and praisers? He said, there I am in the midst. Stop fighting him. Stop with the, can I, stop with the idea. That's, that's not me. Do it. Let that you die and let a new you rise up. I'm, I, I'm trying for someone to get that liberty and freedom and the, and the power of God to move back inside your life and your home and that joy of the Lord return is your strength. Those are the attributes of a worshiper. Listen, be seated. Let me get, let me get this finished. I told someone the other day they, they, want, us, they want to be powerful in God. Look, you can't be powerful in God if you're not prayerful. Can I tell you something? Every time I get up to pray, it doesn't always feel. There's not an angelic host that just steps in there and a bright light comes in and all of a sudden I'm, I'm elevated in a spiritual wings of, 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 of euphoria. A lot of times it takes me a good while to get over myself. Get past myself. Repent of myself that I think I got to feel. Where, where do we get we got to feel a certain way? Get that from the world. That's why you got a pill for this, a pill for that, a pill for this, a pill to get up, a pill to go to bed, a pill to be at work, a, a pill to drive a car. You got to, you are a pill to somebody. You're always worried about your feelings. The truth makes you free, not your feelings. If you're going to worship him in spirit and truth, you got to get the truth. Worshippers humble themselves before God. It's biblical. Though sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I, I, and I tell, if you're pastoral ministry, if you're on the ministry team or the platform, you'll hear me tell you, you need to find yourself a place to pray before service so you can pray with those that just come to be a part of the service. Get yourself down on your face in an altar. I'm going to tell you something. If you are never on your face before God, you're lacking in your worship of God. Tell me I'm lying, and I'll call you one. When you surrender every part of your life to his control, oh boy, and you adore him. Get ready, because this is the adoration season. Oh, come let us adore him. I don't hurt your feelings, but some of us aren't adoring him. We're annoying him. We need to adore him for who he is and not just what he's done. Some of you are performance-based. I prayed that prayer. God didn't answer it. Uh, you know he's been God a long time. You've been, God, you've been alive a long time. You ask him the first time, oh, what? What? So, what, is he a puppy dog or is he God? Because worship is a lifestyle, not an occasional activity. In other words, it's not just something you do here. I'll be honest. I doubt 
if you do it there, or you don't, if you don't do it here, you're going to do it there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Jesus said that the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. But the hour cometh and now is. So the idea of worshiping the Lord of spirit and truth comes from Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well in John 4, 6. In that conversation, the woman was discussing places of worship with Jesus, saying that the Jews worshiped in Jerusalem while the Samaritans worshiped in the mount. Jesus said, had just revealed that he knew about her husbands. She's sitting there trying to school Jesus. Let's just get through all this junk you think you know, and let's get to real you have to know. Can I help you? God already knows. The problem is you're sitting there not knowing God knows because you stopped praising and worshiping a long time ago. Listen to what I'm saying. Knew about her husband as well as the fact that the current man that she lived was not her husband, and this made her uncomfortable. See, you think you're not supposed to be uncomfortable in church. But you know what uncomfortableness does? It makes us... Someone over here said it. Move. Go get a sticker, put it in your back pocket, and sit down. A thorn. You're going to move. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshiper shall worship Father in spirit and in truth. The lesson about worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth is that worship of God is not to be confined to a single geographical location or regulated by temporary provisions or even Old Testament law. Listen, lady. Worship isn't just something you do at a location. Worship is something you live. Worship, listen, see some of you, I'm going to church. Do you know how wrong that is to say that? No, we are the church. We're going to go worship. You don't say that either because some of you just come to sit so you can tell me if I did good or not. And so it's not about me doing good. How, what did you do with the service? Did you come to praise and worship? Or I've been here before and you're not just that, not that into God like that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, he was trying to get her to understand that worship is so much more than the external actions. And it's directed more by truth than ceremony. Is that too much? Is that understood? See, in Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Moses sets down for the Israelites how they are to love their God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. You realize that encompasses everything about us. We got worship on Sundays and Wednesdays, but my might is my finances. My might is my effort. My mm. Worship is truly directed by our love for him. And so if it's non-existent, then we know the answer that if it's worship and praise is only relegated to this building, and not in your home and not in your life and not everything that you do, and you're rising up and you're down and you're up, Because as we love, so we worship. Yes. Yes. The idea of might in Hebrew indicates totality. It, and Jesus expanded this expression, and he added mind and strength in Mark 12 and 30 and Luke 10, when he brought this, said the same thing. To worship God in spirit and truth necessarily involves loving him with heart, soul, mind, and my strength. Your, your greatest strength it should be your greatest sacrifice. True worship must be in spirit. It's engaging. In other words, the truth and my spirit are going to get involved in worshiping God because it engages my whole heart. Because unless there's a real passion for God, there's no worship in the spirit. 
And all of us are at different places of understanding and walking with God. And some of us have allowed some things to rob us and steal from us. And we've had issues and things we point at. I lost this. I had this hurt. I had that. And I sit there and in the, present, in the presence of God, we can sit there because we've lost our worship and pride, our human pride overrides the fact that I'm here for God. I can worship God. I don't care who's teaching and speaking, who's singing, who's in the audience, because that's a true worshiper. Oh, I like this song. I like that song. Hey, man, it's to God who should like all. And so worship must be in truth. In other words, you need to be properly informed. Because unless you have a knowledge of the God we worship, there's no real worship in truth. Both are necessary for God-honoring worship. I, and, and I'm careful here, but I have someone make a statement and I've known for, it's not that you're saying, you don't have your faith. That's arrogant. There's one Lord, one faith, one bad. Where's faith come from, God? You can't turn around and say, I got my faith, I believe it this way. That's not faith. That's confidence in something that's not God. Oh, I have my way of doing it. Okay, no, 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 wait a minute. I don't know how you like your grilled cheese sandwiches. And I don't give a rip how the rest of you ladies make grilled cheese sandwiches. I care about how that lady makes a grilled cheese sandwich for me because she's gonna make, she's not gonna make it how you like it, Brother Bruce. She's gonna make it how I like it. Why? I'm her husband. If I know that she likes something, I'm like, hey, Sister Bruce, how do you like this? Okay, I'm gonna do it for that way. This is where the relationship is. Can I tell you something? If you really wanna fall in love and worship Jesus, then you need to find out how he likes it. Get over yourself. Well, God, I'm just going to make it for you like that. I'll find me someone else to make me my grilled cheese sandwich then. What you even doing here? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Some of you, are, you go to a restaurant. If they don't make it the way you, where do you go? You go where you like it. If he's looking, what's he looking for? Worshippers. What's that mean? Those who love. He's God. Are you serving him or yourself? Oh no 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 no! Let me let me let me salt your grits just a little bit more. Some of you are adamant about some of this doctrine, and you should be. Don't you bail out on this point? Don't you bail out? Well, we got the oneness of God and baptism and holiness. What you're gonna sit there during worship? You're just as backslid. Oh, you? That wasn't harsh. That was liberating. You ain't even got to get in the water to get right. You just got to lift your hands and apologize. You don't understand. Paul and Silas worshiped and sang praise. God changed your situation. You got every reason in the world to shut your mouth, drop your pride, stand to your feet, fall on your face, and worship God. Yeah, you know I got silent right there? God just said you had to do something. But how quick we God, I need this financial need right now. You need to heal me right now, or I'm just gonna. Oh Lord. Spirit without truth will lead to a shallow, overly emotional experience. That's that's what the world wants you to settle for. And as soon as the emotion is over, when the fervor cools and the worship ends, you're on Facebook looking for your next endorphin dump. Get down to the dealership, buying yourself something else to get in debt because you got looking for that feels. Looking for an illicit relationship. I don't know. <laughs> And also truth without spirit can be dry. That's why I'm just not going to get up here and hammer you with truth. Spirit of God's moving in here too. We need both. They work together. The American Christian's nightmare is our stuff 
our entertainment, and our ideology. It steals our spirituality. We get to that place where we achieve something, and we want to sit down on laurels instead of thanking God for it. He told the Israelites, listen, beware, lest thou forget the Lord thy God that brought thee out of Egypt. Some of you forgot what you think you've made yourself out of Egypt. You got yourself out of you, you, you don't even realize that God's looking at you. You got one foot in the world, the other on banana peel, and you stand there. I ain't got to worship God tonight. You didn't even come here to worship. You didn't come here. You came because it's your obligation to come to church. You're not. Get real. Did you get all excited? I got to get there for prayer because I get to talk to Jesus. And yet some of us are sitting around, man, you need a better attitude about how to get a job. That young man needs to learn how to work. That young lady needs to learn how to cook. That young, and we'll sit there. And think, we have all these ideas, but we don't look at ourselves and go. You consider yourself an elder around here. You better elder yourself right into worship and praise in an altar. Or go have a seat in every other area, too. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Matthew 26. This is in the Bible. It hadn't changed. Is he still the same yesterday, today, and forever? Is he still the one of Malachi? I change not. No man can serve two masters. That includes you, folks. <laughs> I can't serve me. I gotta deny me. But everything in America says not to deny myself. Do what feels good. Do what you like. You got the money, get it. But God. For he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man when God knows exactly where you're at right now. The question isn't, is God deceived? The question really is, is how deceived am I? How much have I deceived my Because I'm satisfied with my worship with God. Instead of getting in a place, is he satisfied with mine? Because God wants our spirit and life to focus on him because he is that answer. You got that struggle? You need that job? He's got it. You know, Brother Bruce sits here tonight, and he don't talk. I haven't talked about it in a long time. But God gave that man a job that even his own wife didn't believe he could get. No, that's not a bad thing. You don't understand how great faith can be. There's got to be doubt swimming around it like a shark. It increased her faith, too, when the guy got the job. Some of you got tested. Well, that boy, you shouldn't have a dime to your name according to your education. If anybody stood to their feet and thanked God. I should have been dead a long time ago. I got the medical records to prove it. I'm not. You better believe I'm going to lift my hand and worship God. I ain't trying to shortchange anybody to let you think that you're satisfied with all the money in the world and all the stuff in the world and accolades and people like that ain't going to ever satisfy like worshiping and praising the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Be satisfied. Ain't no one do me like Jesus does. Nobody can. Nothing can. Paul told his charge, Timothy with an urgency because I know Paul had the battle with all that he went through. The man studied at the feet of the most brilliant people, but he turned and walked away from that to serve God. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Ain't nobody free like a preacher and a worshiper. There ain't no one free like me. That he may Please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Ah, you don't know like I know what the Lord's done for me. You better believe he's going to get my worship and my praise. I got no problem coming to an altar, getting on my face, and be honest with the fact. I'll, I tell you, I may not know, but I know the one who does. You have to understand 
that combination of both aspects of spirit and truth of worship results in a joyous appreciation of God informed by scripture. Oh, I know he likes this. He said it in his word. I know he likes that. It is written. I know he's pleased. The more you know about God, the more you appreciate him. The more you appreciate him, the deeper your worship. The deeper your worship, the more God is glorified. 